is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 462. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how was that sandwich, man? I'm jealous. Uh, it was it was okay. I, I, I kind of punted. Um, mm, it was no an Italian mustard. sandwich and it came with a... Uh, like shredded Italian che- or a shaved Italian cheese, but I, I really should have just asked for them to have cheddar on it because cheddar is just that much better. And wow, yeah, so you didn't want the Italian cheese on your Italian sandwich? Nah, I, I, I like cheddar or pepper jack, something a little stronger. It, it just didn't taste that great. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about your sandwich. I, although I still wish I had one for myself. Um, this week on the show, Luis, we're going to be uh, going zoomed out fundamental level up show. I talked to some people at the GP, some of our listeners, and they were saying that they were looking forward to the next level up show. And I thought, you know what, let's give them what they want. And uh, we're actually going to take a look at the LR philosophy from a very big picture perspective to help, uh, especially newer listeners, you know, if you've been only listening for the last year or so, uh, this will give you a little bit of history and a little bit of an idea on how we approach things and how that can affect you and your games and your drafts as you sit down to play uh, Magic each and every single time. And it hits on a lot of the the fundamentals that we care about and that we try to really push on the show. So that's what we're going to be talking about here before we get into it. Some housekeeping. First things first, channelfireball.com. That's the place to go for everything you need magic related on ye old internet. You can find it there, including Guilds of Ravnica. You can get it right now. Order it up. Get a box. Draft it with your friends. Uh, if you need some singles or something for some sweet new standard deck, I saw a lot of brews this week on people's streams and on the internet and everything like that. If you want to pick those up, make sure you get in there and get them early before they spike. Channelfireball.com is a place to do it. And while you're there, you can check out free content. Look, we know you're here to get better at magic. You can get better at magic by watching really great people play. And you can do that at, at Channel Fireball on the uh, video side. And then, of course, articles from some of the best players in the world as well. So please do check them out. Um, also, you can support the show directly. You can uh, give back to the show if you felt like it's helped you out, if it's if it's made your life a little better, whatever. You can go to patreon.com slash limited resources and check it out. There's a bunch of different levels. It's super easy to get set up and it's fully flexible, meaning you can change or drop or do whatever you want at any time. Um, and you get to set caps so that you never hit any amount that you don't want to. Uh, it's it's really completely in your hands. We, we This isn't some shady thing where it's like, hey, come over here, and then you don't really know what you're signing up for. <laughs> you will know exactly what you're signing up for, and uh, and we, we encourage you to do so. Part of the benefits that you get for being a patron of the show as well, there are many, uh, but a few of them are that you're eligible for giveaways. And uh, I like to give away – well, I've been on this giveaway of Playmat a week, and I, I tell you, Luis, this is going to be going on for quite some time. I'm looking at the stack of Playmats that I've accrued over the years from various tournaments and stuff, and uh, – you know oh, what? Yeah, you will not be running out of the soon. No. So this is uh, this is a good time to jump in on the Patreon if you're interested in this because, uh, well, this gives you the best chance to get something because I'm giving away, I don't know, there's probably 50 or I mean, there's a million of them. So this one, this week came from GP Salt Lake City and it is the Playmat. What is this card? I always forget I what card know. this is. This is the, um, it's like a merfolk. Eh, I'll figure it out, but it's a sweet one. She's got like a kind of a, a whip, like a golden whip thing. And she's like, maybe it's a fairy. No, this is a fairy. Yeah, she's got um, she's got wings. I don't think anymore. <laughs> anyway, it's a sweet looking play mat. And the winner of said play mat is Andrew Sukalski from uh, Franklin, Wisconsin. Thank you, Andrew, for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be sending out your play mat uh, probably next week. Um Also, the other thing is whenever we do cracker packs on the show, you know, we do one every show to kind of simulate sometimes more us sometimes more uh, to kind of simulate us doing a booster draft and you getting to sit along with us and hear our thought process and the cards that we consider what we wouldn't consider and that kind of thing. I keep all the rares from those and I put them in a little uh, container here and then every once in a while I just kind of wait until it gets nice and thick. I'll send them out to a listener and now. That's the time. Uh, this one has, let's see what we've got. We've got, oh, we've got a Tezzeret Artifice Master. That's a nice one. There's Thief of Sanity. Uh, the Victus Ismati is in this thing. Thorn Lieutenant, a couple of uh, Gin of Wishes. Some action. Yeah, this one's kind of there. And then like some random stuff from, I don't know, maybe we did, I don't know. I, I've got a Kiku Shadow and an Ayumi the Last Visitor. 
any <laughs> we did a know. champions crack a pack or something like that i guess maybe that, so those yeah betrayers or saviors or something I don't know. <laughs> yeah and a foil anticipate anyway and a bunch of other random rares and uh these ones are going to go off to our friend brent osborne from madison alabama so thank you brent uh for for being a patron and again if you want to be eligible for these I, we're going to be starting a new one uh, this week, another perk you get is you get to submit questions for the Patreon question of the week. And also when we do our uh, Q&A episodes, which are some of our favorite ones, uh, you will be eligible to submit questions for those episodes, too. Our Patreon question of the week, though, this week comes from Ruthie, who says, hi, uh, Demir decks in this format seem to have a consistent discard sub theme, much more so than in other limited formats I've played. I'm f I find myself doing one of two things when facing Demir, especially if I've seen disinformation campaign first. I'll try keeping something discardable in hand. When this isn't an option, I often decide to play out my hand so that they have no targets. Is this correct? How should I approach playing against decks like this? And uh, and Ruthie says, P.S. Love the mechanics. Uh, not being able to uh, keep secrets from Demir is just great flavor. Yeah, that is kind of true, isn't it? Anyway, what's the, strategically speaking, you know, that there are quite a few. There's two cards that we see often with disinformation campaign and the the thought sees uh, thought erasure thought erasure yeah yeah and then there's even in sealed or occasionally in in certain never uh, draft yeah never happened pops in so what should people be doing should you should you keep an extra land in your hand should you just empty out your hand anyway so I, I actually like where Ruthie's coming from on this since the answer is you should be doing both those things just at different times mm -hmm. if you have a really good card in your hand but you're not gonna be able to play it out quite yet you're often gonna want to keep an extra land or even something bad in hand so that uh, your opponent can't snipe it with a disinformation campaign. That said, once you get to the point where you don't have much left in hand that's good, like you're actually better playing out everything. So if they do play disinformation campaign, you don't discard a card. So it, if I had to put in order of priority what you should be prioritizing, the first is protecting your good card. So if you have, let's say you've got a, a good six drop in hand, right? You have a City Watch Sphinx. You're often going to want to uh, or play uh, keep something bad back. Like there's a chance you just don't want to play one of your cheap creatures. Like let's say you have a wall of mist in your hand. You've played mm -hmm. your fifth land. Your hand is now land land number six. City Watch Sphinx wall of mist. Often you're not, you're not going to want to play the wall of mist, especially in a spot where it's not going to do something right away. So that if they do make you discard, you can discard that and then play land number six. City Watch Sphinx. The second priority once that's once you don't have something good to protect is make sure they don't get anything with it. So play out all your cards as fast as you can. And those are like the two biggest ways to minimize the effect of disinformation campaign. Thought Erasure is a little harder because the fact that they can go and choose means, yeah, you can't really do anything about it. Like play your good cards and hope that they don't snipe them, but you can't really, there's no real protecting your good cards in, in that kind of spot. Uh, side note, I think disinformation campaign by itself makes the format much less pleasant to play. <laughs> oh, so. yeah. I mean, depending on which side of it you're on, it's such a sweet card to have in your pile and so annoying to play against on the other side. Oh, it's just a very powerful card, but it's also, I think, I'm more even complaining about the play pattern rather than just the power level. It's just unpleasant to, to like, when your opponent plays this on turn three, you just don't feel like playing the rest of the game. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it, it's a pretty rough no, card. No, that is true, for sure. I mean, um, you can you, you can do something about it. Like, this this question was a very good example of that, but yeah, it's still, still going to be pretty hard. What what about what type of archetype you're in? I mean, you know, I found that if I'm in Boros, I'm more likely to just want to play the card that I draw anyway. So I don't mind going down to zero cards uh, quite as quickly because a lot of my cards are cheaper and castable or they're more straightforward, a removal spell or a creature or something like that uh, versus the type of cards where you're playing like in a mirror maybe with Demir, uh, which if you play a lot of Arena, you will find yourself in a lot of Demir mirrors these days. Um, you know, boy you know keeping that last counter spell in your hand or that last you know board affecting card or whatever is different uh you know than when you're playing in boros yeah i i think that it's it can be a little harder depending on which which deck you're playing but the decks that don't need a lot of lands are also more prone to keep lands in hand like the city watch sphinx example that that's the sort of thing that's hard because you couldn't discard a land otherwise you wouldn't be able to play your expensive spell so when you're playing something like boros and your curve tops out at four you're not really paying a cost to keep your fifth land in hand just in case and discarding it. Mm -hmm. When you're playing Demir where you just have a lot of things to do with your mana, then it becomes harder and then you're maybe more on the play things out plan. So okay. I think that the most important part is knowing how many lands your deck needs to operate. Because there's some like decks like a Golgari deck that just wants eight lands in play. There's some Boros decks that would rather not draw land after number four. 
And right. knowing which one you are can help inform your discards. Okay. So keep that in mind, especially if, like uh, Ruthie said, if you've seen disinformation campaign, you know, that's a card that can always draw off the top and can ruin your day. Um, let's do a crack a pack, Luis. And this one's actually really cool. It comes from our friend Peter uh, Tubergen. And this is, I can't remember exactly how it worked, but do you remember th there was this special box that you could buy from the Hasbro store? I think it was supposed to be maybe like a, uh, a special giveaway and I don't I don't really know what happened with it but they ended up selling it on the Hasbro store exclusively and it was one where like you'd get 24 packs for like 200 bucks or something but yeah, some of the, the this packs, is the mythic planeswalker pack yeah and some of the packs inside though would be a special pack that would be a regular guilds of ravnica pack but would also have a special edition planeswalker like with alternate art and and I think it's foil or something like that well Peter gave us one of those packs so yeah, that's I awesome. have yeah, so I have in my hand one of these packs that I think is guaranteed to get one of those special Planeswalkers along with the regular set. So I, as I said, with all crack -a packs I give the rares away. So this is going to start the next uh, pile of them to be given away. And thank you very much, Peter, for this. This is really cool. It's, it's rough. It won't have the Mythic Planeswalker and we'll just have to keep it. <laughs> yeah yeah we'll just have to keep it I, I like that idea um and then but of course um for the planeswalker we won't be considering it for picks for the pack because you know that that seems kind of stupid if i open a planeswalker i'll be taking it yes well if, if you open up a real you know an actual planeswalker <laughs> we'll let you take it uh healer's hawk one uh, so one for white I, I, yeah this is the lifelink. one mana for one on flying lifelink i think healer's hawk I, I think luminous bonds is better but i think healer's hawk is actually in the argument or in the conversation about for best mm -hmm. white common, mm -hmm. just because of how good it is in the Boros decks and how important it is to have this card. Yeah, the card's really, really good and just fits in nicely uh, to, to multiple strategies as we predicted. Uh, Which coin crab? Chalet. It's three and a blue for a two five. I brought this I, card in I, out of the from the board a couple of times. I'm not yeah. super happy with it in the main though. I, I play this card uh, a decent amount, yeah, post-board. There are some decks where you play a 2-5. It's actually really annoying for them. So mm -hmm. I, I like the Wishcoin Crab. I, I, I mean, clearly we're taking Healer's Hawk here over Wishcoin Crab. That's right. Uh, sure Strike is next, and this card's performed really well, too. Oh, yeah. It's always been good. It feels like it's like maybe a little bit of a notch even better now uh, yeah. in this format. So Sure Strike, I think, ranges from like playable to, to good, depending on the format. It's rarely worse than that. But I think it's on the good the good end of the scale here. It's yeah. It's just really important for pushing through things like the Wishcoin Crab. <laughs> sure, but no, more I mean, importantly, just like, yeah, it, it just knocks down blockers really effectively. Yeah, that is true. And then, but then also in the Is it deck, you know, it has this this massive effect where like it combos really well with cards like Gravitic Punch. It wakes up your your Piston Fist Cyclops. It gets your uh, what's it called? Uh, your wee dragonauts in for like a massive hit just for yeah. two mana, you know, and these are, th that's kind of the name of the game, especially for the aggressive. Is it deck is getting in those huge damage hits while the shields are down and sure strike is often part of some of the most explosive parts of that beam splitter mage, also a great target for sure strike. So a lot going on with it uh, in the format, even though it is still just ultimately kind of a, a pretty basic uh, pump spell. Still, I like healers hawk better. I mean, all of that, talk about sure strike is still within the context of a combat trick it's still not something that i'm going to prioritize yeah the, the hawk is almost assuredly better right uh dowser of lights this is the five mana four five this is surprisingly playable i'm still surprisingly not upgrading. playable yeah. i'm not upgrading it to good but you know i thought this was going to fall into the like wish coin crab territory of yeah mm -hmm. you might side this in if, if the stats were good i think the demir decks play it about half the time when they have one maybe a little bit more yeah I think so too. Uh, but again, Healer's Hawk better. Urban Utopia, this is one in a green. Uh, see, Enchant Land, the land uh, can tap for any color of mana and you draw a card when it ETBs. I've been uh, actually trying out the new hot tech, Luis, the uh, the five color deck <laughs> yeah. in this format. And I have. I've, I've actually been uh, really kind of pushing in that direction just to, to see what's there, you know, in the name of science. And Urban Utopia has surprisingly not really been a big part of the equation for me. Um, I find that your deck is so slow with all the tap lands that adding an additional kind of wheel spinning card like Urban Utopia doesn't end up paying dividends. Um, it's just too slow uh, in addition to an already slow deck. So I don't actually prioritize it even for that deck. And otherwise, I don't want it at all. 
I agree with uh, everything you said there, except the surprising part. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I just don't. I have not found your utopia to be particularly good. Uh, good. Uh, Mood, Moonmark Painter is next. Boy, this thing's been a flop. Two black black for a two three, and has undergrowth when it enters the battlefield. Target creature gets menace and plus X plus zero until the turn racks is number of creatures in your yard. This card Hate closed this out card. Grand Prix Denver, I believe. Uh, Did it? But, yeah, but I, I, I still would not advocate for it. it. It's just, it's exactly the wrong kind of undergrowth card, I think. It's Agreed. not good if you don't get the good value out of the ability because a four mana two three is terrible. You really need to get like plus three or plus four to before I start getting excited. And the undergrowth text is not that aggressive. So it's just like a lot of weird disparate things that don't don't add together well. So I, I'm pretty low on Moodmark Painter. I'm still on the healer's hawk here. Yeah, I'm also just disappointed in it because it is kind of like one of the premier... Uh, undergrowth commons like it's the one that stands out and it's just like eh? yeah. ooh, upgrade here we go maybe the best common in the whole set louise all right dead weight yeah i was hoping you, you were gonna say uh <clears throat> uh dead weight instead of deadly visit because yeah, yes i, I think dead weight is dead weight ahead of it now yeah. de dead weight is much better it, it, the first yeah. dead weight is just so important and so is the yep. second actually uh it's just so good against yep. boros while also being fine in every other matchup so yeah. really hard to argue against dead weight yeah i went on the um on the weekly mtg stream uh with blake rasmussen yesterday for mm -hmm. for wizards i drove down to wizards and we went on it and he wanted to talk uh <clears throat> talk about uh guilds limited and they had me just like make a couple of um, top fives, like top five on commons and top five commons. And I put dead weight at number one. Like I, I just, I, I think that like the, the role it serves in the decks that want it is just critical. And when we were talking about it on the show, it really made me realize why uh, besides the normal things, like it kills, you know, everything that costs one, two and some three drops in the set even kills a couple of fives in the set, which is just kind of yeah. random. But um, but also it's because we don't get removal like this anymore. Right. Like, look at the other black removal spell at common. It costs five mana and it's really good. Like Deadly Visit's great. Like I, I play that card. I like it a lot. I think it's excellent. But you just don't get efficiency like this anymore where you're, you know, this card and then we have to go up to uncommon, but lava coil, you know, these are the two cards that like you just net, you're always netting mana on the exchange. And that is one of the ways in a game where two players are spending most of their mana every turn. It's kind of a slug fest to get way ahead is to spend one mana to kill their three drop and then play a two drop or spell two mana on a, you know, uh, on a lava coil and God forbid, kill their city watch Sphinx for no value for them. Right. It's just a disaster for them. If, if both players are playing spells, if the game is slowed to a crawl, then it, it ends up being a little bit more uh, focused on raw power level, but still, yeah, dead weight to me is going to be really difficult to, to overcome. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, under city uprising. No, Nope. All right. What, where are you at on this one? I, I need, I need your take on this. Cause I've had some talks, uh, Parhelion patrol, the two, three flying huh. vigilance with mentor for four. I don't love it. It's it's a hole filler if you have enough one strength creatures that you can, you know, reliably get a mentor off of it. But for the most mm -hmm. part, I just don't think Parhelion Patrol is where you want to be. It's just too expensive. Okay. And the stats just aren't there. Yeah, I'm a little higher on it than you, but not much. But boy, I've had some discussions where people are really high on it. Like, Weird. you, I actually had a discussion where this was compared to Sky Knight Legionnaire. Uh, yeah, I can see the comparison. They're both flying creatures with two power. The comparison <laughs> ends basically there. But yeah, that's, but yeah, that, that's true. They uh, both share a characteristic. I, I, I don't think that's remotely close. Okay, I don't either. All right, and that was my take at the time. I, All mean, right, I, I would take Deadweight for sure out of this pack, but I'd followed up with Healer's Hawk before I looked at Parhelion Patrol. Agreed, 100%, yeah. Uh, by the way, our gate is Golgari Guildgate. Okay. Um, we've got our uncommons, Swarm Guild Mage. This is the uh, the Golgari Guild Mage. It's green, black for a 2-2. Two -two. You can pay one and a green, tap it to gain two. Life, or you can pay four and a black, tap it to give all your creatures plus one, plus zero, and menace until in the turn. Uh, I mean... It's good, but it's not it's not yeah. better than Deadweight for sure. Yeah, exactly. Like just I, not even if I was straight up Golgari, I would just take the Deadweight. And the fact that you don't know which color you are here means it's not particularly close. What about Necrotic Wound? This is the this is the instant speed Deadweight, Luis. That's that's exactly yeah. what this is. <laughs> Black instant undergrowth target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. It also exiles if the creature happens to die. Uh, Necrotic Wound is so much worse than Deadweight. I, I no, think Necrotic Wound's worse than Healer's Hawk. I agree. Like, 
like sure you, you can play the wound in your in your uh golgari decks or even your demir decks depending on how what, what the configuration is but definitely not a card which i'm like excited about most of the time or or will take very highly yeah I'm, I, I will play one begrudgingly. Uh, Pilfering Imp, black for a 1-1 one, one flyer. You can pay one and a black and uh, tap it and sack it to take a card away from your opponent's hand that's a non-land card. Uh, you can only do it at sorcery speed. I like Pilfering Imp. It's got a lot of little incidental synergies. The The level one is that uh, it works well with Undergrowth because it just adds a creature to your graveyard. But mm-hmm. even past that, like sometimes you have like Midnight Reaper or Beast Whisperer, which, yes, both those are rares, but that is a good combo. Uh it also is a good way to do something that can impact the course of the game early, especially in a slower deck. Like just playing a turn one pilfering up is a pretty pretty good leadoff. Then in the middle of the game, it loses some luster, but it's still decent. I, I think the card is fine. I still think it's worse than both Deadweight or Messenger Hawk or sorry, Healer's Hawk pick one pack one. Yeah, same. Yeah, I'm still on Deadweight. Our rare is wah, wah, Chromatic Lantern. So this is three mana artifact. Taps to add one mana of any color and let your lands tap for one mana color as well boy this card's yeah. been a real dud I, I haven't really wanted it at all um i've been drafting the five color deck like i said and i think this would go in it and it would be okay but honestly i think you could it's probably w- make an argument that a random locket would be better than it oh, yeah. yeah i think this is worse than a locket because you can't you can't cash it in for two cards later and once you're paying three to fix your mana it's not really getting it's it doesn't help the taps for five colors instead of just two Right. So. And then and even if you're in a multicolored deck, you know, you also still have to run all of the guild gates and stuff. So you, a lot of your lands are still just tap lands that tap yeah. for like additional color. So I'm out on that. So we would take dead weight out of this pack, but boy, this thing is gorgeous, man. I got to the planeswalker here. This is Duretti Ingenious Iconoclast. I'll take that probably. So yeah, I don't know what it does, but I'll tell you. It's a one black red for a three loyalty planeswalker. Uh it plus ones to make a colorless uh construct. Uh, the one one with defender it's an artifact <clears throat> that's funny so uh, there was a, a token in this pack and i'm like what is this co- it's a one one defender construct and i was yeah. like this is weird oh, it must it must come with uh... it must come with it so i'll keep those together for whoever ends up winning it you'll get one construct on us uh minus one you may sacrifice an artifact if you do destroy target artifact or creature and then ultimate minus six choose target artifact card in a graveyard or artifact card on the battlefield to create three tokens that are copies of it wow that's a lot going on for a three mana planeswalker also these are absurdly gorgeous holy crap they they did them it looks like an extension like you know like when people do altars and they take mm-hmm. the artwork and move yeah, it all the way I've to the that. edges yeah it looks like that and it's also like this sort of low-key foil damn all right i guess we still have to give it away right we said we would yeah we're gonna give we're, the winner of this month's uh giveaway will be to uh Garvis Elscott. <laughs> <laughs> your, your new roommate. <laughs> yeah. uh, and by the way, this is kind of funny because it's, it's, a, it's a commander. We've, we've got Duretti Chromatic Lantern. <laughs> so if, if you're into commander and you listen to the show, you're, you're well on your way. Okay. Uh, so great stuff there. I'll put that in the, in the next one and we'll, we'll get that thing going. But let's get into our main topic because this is, I mean, the, the the thing we're going to talk about today is really probably the most important thing that we things that we care about on the show, and they make up the fundamental core of the LR approach to gaming, magic, sometimes even life, uh, depending on on the situations that you find yourself in. And we're going to break them down into kind of three broad parts. The first one's going to be about theory. The next one's going to be about practice, and the next one's going to be about application and how you actually apply these things. So I, I'm going to start off with story time um, for part one, which is which is the theory. So sit back, Luis, and uh, enjoy the story. I know you love listening to me talk about this stuff. Um, <laughs> the LR mentality, as it exists now, started actually quite a bit before LR even existed. Um, you know, now we've got this like stable of level up topics and ideals and ideas and all these things that we talk about routinely on the show, and you know they make up the overall ideal of LR, which is Fundamentally, it's the nuts and bolts spike mentality. Uh, that's an archetype of player, uh, if you've never heard of those. you know. And spike is, is considered the tournament player or the player who values winning over anything else, which we are. Uh, we are that. Um, but a nuts and bolts spike specifically cares about improving their gameplay by focusing on the decisions that, that they made rather than the actual result of any given match. And we kind of really try to embody that where we take a, a, an approach to gaming 
that is is focused on the information that we have and the decisions that we can make on it and not letting ourselves get carried away by the result of that match. And this goes to the core of a lot of the things that we talk about on the show. We express it in different ways. Like we say, don't be Roddy. That's results oriented thinking. Don't, don't be like that. Um, decisions, not results, right? This is something that Ryan Spain brought to the show way back in the first few episodes of it, um, which is, again, it's just a mantra that you can tell yourself, I'm focusing on my decisions and the re results themselves will play themselves out over the long term in my favor as long as I'm making good decisions as I go. Me personally, the impetus for all of this stuff came to me quite a bit before the show actually started. I was learning poker from reading books and going on forums like the 2 plus 2 forums and some private forums and talking with my poker group about hands and stuff because it was my goal at the time to try to become like a semi-professional player, a player who could consistently earn money uh, by playing poker, uh, but not necessarily have it be my my full-time job. That was my goal at the time. It ended up being a, a big, a much bigger chunk of my income, at least for a stretch after I quit my job uh, to try to do magic stuff. But still, that was my goal at the time. And so I took it very seriously. I, I wanted to get really good at this and, and understand the fundamentals of it. And, you know, one of the first lessons that you'll learn about when you play poker is equity. And you'll talk about your equity in a hand. And that's how, you know, what percentage of the time you win that hand. And that's something that you have to understand early on because it's just a fundamental concept about it. Um, and you'll start to, to learn and, and, and grasp the different equities of different types of hands as they pop up. Um, the term that was used at the time to describe equity and make it kind of more accessible to people that weren't really used to this type of uh, language was Sklansky Bucks. And uh, that's a, it's a weird term to hear now because I just got used to hearing it before. But David Sklansky, he was an early poker theorist and author. He wrote extensively about poker strategy. And he developed a reputation as like an authority on poker strategy. And the concept that I know him best for, at least, was Sklansky Bucks. And Sklansky Bucks is, a, is simply how much you had earned in equity from a given hand in poker, which is then contrasted with what you actually made or lost in the hand uh, most of the time. So for example, if you got all in, so all of your money's in and all of your uh, opponent's money's in, and you have a, a pair, like let's say you have aces, and your opponent has a lower pair, like say queens, uh, you're about 80% to win that pot on average. So meaning if we took a computer and ran out all, all of the possible iterations of, of the cards that could come out after that point, about 80% of the time you would win the pot. So if, for example, after we had put all of our money in, there was $100 in the pot, I would have earned 80 Sklansky bucks. Okay, so this was just a way, a kind of a cute way for somebody to track how they did. Because the problem is, is that you can't actually make $80 from that pot in any scenario, which is kind of the irony of it. Um, you can win 100 if you win the pot, you can lose a hundred if you lose if you lose the pot, or sometimes in poker there's chops, meaning that it's a tie and, and then you split the pot 50-50. That doesn't happen too often. But those are the only three actual outcomes that are possible. Yet when you would write it down in your log or when you would consider how you played in the hand, you would say, I made the $80 worth of equity by playing the hand the way that I played it. And that's what's important. And it also works in reverse because let's say I was a player, you know, with the Queens and my opponent had the aces, I will have made 20 Sklansky bucks there, which is a loss, right? I've put in 50. So I'm actually down on the transaction, but that's important for me to note because one thing that can happen is I might win the hand, right? One out of five times I win that hand. And I go, if I'm new to poker or new to gaming, I might go, well, I guess I did it right because I won. And like, I know I'm probably aware that I got lucky on some level, but I don't really know what the inner workings of it are. And I might go home that night with a whole bunch of money and think, well, I play great. I am good at this game. I am doing it right. Even though in reality, I got lucky a couple of times and I shouldn't have made nearly as much as I did. And this is a really important lesson, you know, that needs, you need to get if you're going to play poker, but it applies to many, many other things as well. The idea being that I shouldn't care as much if I won or lost the pot, but instead how much equity I had in it. And you know what? For me, that was huge. It was this paradigm shift for me because as a, <clears throat> I didn't, I grew up playing a lot of video games and stuff, but not tabletop games and, and not, you know, gambling with numbers and stuff like that. I did not really understand how these things worked at the time. So for me, 
the easiest way to tell whether I did well or not would be to look at if I won or not. And I didn't really have the language to understand any of the minutia in between. Now I stopped looking at whether I had won the hand or not. I just like, I just, my, the eye of Sauron was on that. And now it just shifted up further in the hand onto the decision that I had made with the information that I had at the time prior to getting all in or to making the big play that I had made. And for me, this was huge. I mean, th th this was like life changing. I was like, wow, like I am focusing on the totally wrong part of everything. Right. I, you know, if I shoot a shot at basketball, if it happens to go in, that doesn't mean that I did everything right. Uh, you know, if we happen to win a game, it doesn't mean that I did everything right. And when I started to get my targets on focusing in on the part of the thing that I could actually control, that really was eye opening for me. Well, and, yeah, I, I think that mm -hmm. getting to results, getting past results oriented thinking is something that most people just don't do. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really difficult. And I had a very similar you know, kind of epiphany and it wasn't exactly on the results part. It was on the EV part, the expected value part, mm -hmm. it, and it, but it all comes to the same place, which is your expected value when you do this is X. So mm -hmm. it is about looking at what, what can I expect out of this? And yeah, your expected value can be of, of a certain play can be, you know, $3, even though you'll either win $0 or $10, mm -hmm. but it makes sense to make that play. Right. And, once I figured out, oh, wow, this is a way to quantify outcomes that look like they're either, you know, A or B, but the actual value of the outcome is somewhere in between because you, you're not always A, you're not always B. And trying to to figure out, like for magic, it, it's huge because it's it's not just like, okay, if I make this play and my opponent has a counterspell, it's really bad for me. But if they don't have a counterspell, it's good for me. It's not just what are the odds they have a counterspell. It's also how good is it when it's good and how bad is it when it's bad. Right. There's these sliders that you have to be able to, uh, yeah, to and do. It's, yeah. And this exactly played to you know how I want to think about things and how I want to think about games or things that aren't games where it's like, well, when you're winning, you, you your tolerance for risk goes down. You shouldn't make a play that you – know, they're only 10% to have it, but if they have it, I lose in a game where you think you're like 95% to win. On the other hand, if you think it's a game you're almost assuredly going to lose, they could almost almost assuredly have it, but it's still worth going for because if they don't have it, you win and you are otherwise not going to win the game. Right. And really trying to figure out how to move those dials and make decisions is something that I think we strive to teach people because it's really it's really hard to get there. It's really hard yes. to, to think about things that way. And it's really valuable when you do. So I, I yeah. think that – the first step, you know, I think for both of us was realizing, hey, this is a really good way to approach the world. Right. And a lot of our lessons kind of go towards that. Right. I mean, because to me, this is about maximizing your chance of getting the outcome you wanted, not about the outcome itself, right? Like if you continually maximize your chance of getting what you want, in the long term, you end up way ahead, way, way, way ahead, right? If you apply this thinking to a magic game, sure, it may not have it may only have a few percent change on the game that you're playing but then game you know matches are best two out of three so if you apply it you get the percentage in all three games if there's three or two games if there's two games played so now you're you're you know stacking up more equity then you take that and you zoom out and you do it over the course of say a three round tournament like a booster draft well now it's every game every round you're maximizing on that equity then you take it out over the course of like a long tournament, like day one of a GP. And, you know, somebody like you, Luis, who sits down and is really, really good at maximizing that edge, all of a sudden will start to see more results. Now, again, on any one tournament, it might not pan out for you. But if I zoom out and I look at 10 tournaments or your career, then all of it comes out in the wash and you see – eight pro tour top eights. And it's like, well, how does this guy have these yet? These other players have been playing on the pro tour for about the same amount of time and have zero or one, right? Even though if you sat down against that player, right, you might have a small edge over them in any given match. In fact, they may be you, right? In any match, they might just beat you and walk away and go, Hey, I just beat Luis Scott Vargas. That was sweet. But what they can't beat and what the world can't beat is if you continually maximize on your equity Every single time you sit down and have a chance to do so, the more you do it, the more it adds up. And eventually the numbers can't hold you back anymore and you will experience success at whatever it is that you're trying to do. But it can take time. And that's another thing that's really hard because, you know, you think 
well, why am I even doing this, right? I mean, how many times, Luis, have you played a game of Magic and felt like you did the things that were correct and you maybe even found some really cool plays or some creative lines that maybe not everybody would have seen, but you lost anyway, right? Your brain will tell you, well, then what was the point? Like, it didn't matter that I outplayed my opponent, right? But it does, because if you do that over and over again, you'll actually see those results in the long range. Yeah, and, and uh, it's a huge deal. Learning how to le- learning how to keep yourself sane when you make the right decision and lose over and over again is a big part of what magic has, you know, I think taught us. And mm-hmm. I, I, it's funny because we look, we're certainly a magic centric podcast. This is a podcast about magic, and I think we're very much nuts and bolts in the terms of, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about later is that we one of our stated goals is that every episode has some good actionable takeaways. And we're, you know, we're going to talk about some guild specific stuff later to get into that. But I do think that a lot of the lessons that we share here are, are really applicable outside of magic. And I think that like the number one thing that I have learned from magic that helps me in my life is knowing that you're going to lose a lot of times that you do things and knowing that you, that shouldn't stop you from making the right play over and over again. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it is very difficult to learn that lesson. It really is. Um, you know, one of the things that happened to me, by the way, w- around the time when I was learning poker, by the way, that did let me translate this to real life was I decided to buy a condo and I could like barely afford it, but I wanted to get this place because I wanted to, to move into it. I was going to move anyway, and I didn't want to rent. Um, and the loan process was really stressful. It was tedious and I hadn't done anything like it before. I was kind of doing it on my own. So it was kind of scary. I mean, it, it was, it was just like, they, they ask you for all these documents and you just don't really understand what's at play at any given point. And, you know, a good chunk of your future is kind of in somebody else's hands and you don't really know the rules of the game. But I remember this as one of the first times I really internalized something that I learned from a game like in this case poker and then applied it to real life because when I had opportunities to do the paperwork and to complete the tasks that they were asked me to do, I did it exactly how they asked. I got every document. I sent it over. I double checked stuff whenever I could before I sent it. Uh, I, I you know, sent it with tracking to make sure they got it, right? Just so that there was no excuse for me to say, well, if you would have just paid a little more attention or done the, the things in the amount of time that you needed to do them, uh, that you could have done it. And once I sent those final papers over, they say, okay, we've got all the papers. And then they take some amount of time to review all of them before uh, approving or not approving your loan. Normally, this is the most stressful part, right? I mean, you're waiting for some person to put a stamp on a piece of paper or not, and it could change, you know, the next five years of your life or whatever. And that's really stressful for most people because it's like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I didn't feel that way. I felt like kind of good. I was just like, you know what? I'm super fine because you know what? I set myself up to be successful on this. And if I didn't get the loan, it wasn't because of anything that I had left on the table, right? I got the most amount of, you know, Sklansky bucks or whatever for this transaction. And to me, that's what it was all about now, because I understood that it wasn't about the result. There's only so much you can do on your end to control the outcomes that you want. And it was about maximizing my chance to do good over and over and over again. It's a real grind. I mean, life is like that and poker is like that. And so is magic. I mean, when you look at people that are successful, a lot of times it's because they've been willing to do something that is kind of grindy for a lot longer than people that weren't. Uh, That happens in investing and work, right? And work related (laughs) scenarios. I mean, uh, we we were talking about this the other day. What what is the average? How long has the average Platinum Pro been playing magic for? Mm -hmm. And it's just double digit years, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, So anyway, it's about applying edges consistently over the long term to see this success. And that's something that you have to really internalize when you sit down to play magic. And it's something that the next time you feel frustrated because you lost a match or a tournament that you thought you were well prepared for, that you thought you should win, it should stick in your head that like, that's not how this works. You, You just should never have expectations along those lines. And I know how hard that is because look, we're human beings, right? We, when, a, when a listener turns on the show and they say, I'm going to listen to LR because I want to get better, it's because I want to win, right? Like, w- what's the point of listening to a show like this and to, and to putting in the work and the practice? It's so that I can win. But you can't think that way. You just cannot. You will win, but it's a byproduct of the actual work 
which is to focus on your decisions and your preparedness and your mental game and your gameplay and all these other things that go into a extremely difficult and complicated game like Magic. Uh, it's not about coming here to win. And that's where Magic came in for me, by the way. Um, you know, Ryan Spain, my original co-host, we've had him on. I'm sure we'll have him on again. He started teaching me how to actually play Magic when he brought me back into the game around that time. I, by the way, I did get the condo. Uh, and, you know, the cool part about that. Yeah, but that shouldn't matter. Yeah, it did. I wasn't. <laughs> I just, you know, I just thought <laughs> they might want to know. Uh, the cool part was, is that Ryan was also in my poker group. And so he knew how to translate the poker concepts that I had worked hard on into magic things like just practical things like how many outs you have in your deck, right? If you, if you haven't played a card game that much, that might not mean a whole lot to you. You're like, well, how many outs do you have? You're like, well, what do you mean? I just draw one card per turn. And it's like, well, some of those, <laughs> you know, matter here and some of them don't. How many of them matter versus how many don't? You're like, oh, I see. That's the kind of thing that I just, you know, inherently already knew. So he could just tell me that kind of stuff. Tilt control. Right. I, you know, uh, poker is an extraordinarily frustrating game. And it took me a little while to kind of understand the concepts and stuff. And before I could do it without feeling emotional, without feeling frustrated if I wasn't winning or if somebody, you know, did something dumb but won anyway, that would bother me. But by the time I was learning magic, that was kind of behind me and I had a much better sense of tilt control. So when I lost a tough game of magic, it didn't, it didn't, you know, rile me up emotionally. I was just like, well, that sucks. I wish I would have won, but next game. Um, understanding your odds in different scenarios, managing my expectations, like what I was just talking about, maximizing my equity rather than expecting certain results like I was just talking about. And then also like the management and concealment of information. Like that's something that you, you, you're you worried about in poker and that in even more so in magic, uh, you know, it matters quite a bit. All of that translated pretty directly for me. And in, in magic, I found a way to flex those muscles. You know, I just, I was able to use those skill set to get up to speed quicker than I normally would. Now I wasn't just amazing. I'm still not, but you know, I at least got to the point where I could be a competent approaching good player a lot quicker than I think I normally would have because of those, uh, those other things. And, you know, I mentioned it before, but you know, just think about how many times your decisions matter, even just over the course of like one booster draft, right? Every pick. You're applying your skill and your logic and you're accruing that edge. Every pick in the draft, you do it. Every time you build your deck and you say, I could splash for this thing, but instead I'm not going to, I'm going to build a more streamlined deck. Or you understand fundamentally what your deck's trying to do and you build towards that better than somebody else, you're getting the edge. And of course, every single turn, basically every turn you play of a game of magic is another opportunity for you to, to flex. It's, it's for you to say, hey... Uh, I know better than my opponents or better than the average player or whatever, and I'm going to accrue that advantage. It does add up a lot quicker than you might think, even if it doesn't feel like that sometimes. Um, and then, of course, the other big section or big takeaways or the big things for our show uh, that we concentrate on level ups are a way of combating our feeble brain and its propensity to lie to us, right? Our our brains are ge geared to be results-oriented you know, the thinking is, is that this base level of logic helped us survive, you know, thousands of years ago or whatever. And it makes some sense, right? If we just didn't have any mapping or any pattern way to hand down from generation to generation on what to do and what not to do, our whole species would probably just get stuck making the same mistakes, right? Like at some point, you know, uh, human beings, when they, when they walk up to an edge of a cliff, there's something in your brain that tells you, whoa, don't go there. But like, your parents didn't teach you that. That's just inherently in your in your genetic makeup. Well, my assumption is that a few people had to get hurt or die way back in the day for that to happen. And, you know, so it's a good thing that our brain says, okay, there's a potential outcome here and it could be bad, so we should avoid it. That's good in general for a species. But when it comes to playing games like Magic, that can really, really get in the way. Uh, it can absolutely stop you from doing things that you should do because they feel bad or they make you feel scared or they inhibit some, that there's some uh, reaction that you have in your body or your brain about making a play. And like Luis, one of the ones that comes up all the time is when you have to take an extraordinarily risky line to try to scoop up a win percentage in a game that you wouldn't normally be winning at all, right? The type of thing where you have to make some crazy attack where you just like let four or five of your creatures die to push in three damage to hope to draw that one spell off the top. Yeah, and because that feels you, bad, you you're gonna run into this all the time where your 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 brain really does want to betray you because it is looking for it's looking for easy outs, it's looking for patterns that aren't there, and 
it's looking for it has like a lot of confirmation bias and all these other things that are really uh damaging to your to your long-term goals when especially when it comes to magic so mm -hmm. you kind of have to fight through that and just you know obviously our our, our brains are extremely powerful tools you just have to know how mm -hmm. to use them and i uh yeah you know one of the things i, I always talk about is intuition and it, you know, knowing how to harness that because it will try to trick you is really important. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, in in our world, in real world and also in Magic Poker and other games, things don't work out so straightforwardly, right? Like I can just walk away from the edge of a cliff or not eat something poisonous or whatever um, and just be like, well, I guess I just didn't die. So I just get to keep living. But here you can easily do something very dumb and reckless, but also just have it work out for you right? Uh, you could do something very smart too. You could do something really clever, but not work out for you. And if you just blindly follow the results from these examples, well, you'd be going about life backwards and likely costing yourself a ton of equity over the long term. So it requires a lot of nuance to be able to understand the factors at play here and how to interpret them and not just listen to your initial instinct from your brain. Because you know, your brain will also tell you to do dumb things like concede matches that you still have a reasonable amount of equity in. And just for the reason that it sucks to sit there because you feel like you're going to lose, right? But if you have 15% equity, that's actually a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot. And you are likely going to lose. I mean, that's a really bad position to be in. And a lot of people just give up. They just yeah, say, well, you know, I'm done here. About one in seven, one in you know, a little less than seven mm -hmm. times, you, you, you'll end up winning those games. That's right. And like, dang, that's a lot to give up over the long term. Remember, we're thinking long term here. Or, you know, maybe you just get cocky and play loose when you're ahead. You just think, well, I got this guy and I'm going to, I don't, it doesn't really matter what I do now. And now, you know, one in 10 games, you give it away because you just decided not to, to get in there. But, you know, your brain will tell you it's okay. You're winning. You got this. Don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about these little things. And it's like, if you become aware of that, then you can prevent it, right? And the same thing with this sort of risk slider, right? Not to take risks, even though it's the only way to win the game. One thing that happens to human brains, or at least mine, is when I get behind in a game of magic, I get more conservative, right? I think, well, right. if I can just hang on. But if, you know, you know, devil or angel Luis were to show up on my corner, uh, excuse me, on my Isn't shoulder. Angel Luis? <laughs> yeah, apparently. And, and say, hey... So let's say that this game goes for another seven turns. Are you winning that game? And I'd be like, no. Like I have a bunch of two drops that I'm going to draw off the top of my deck and my opponent has six drops that they can play. Like this isn't a viable strategy anyway. You know, so then you might say, well, maybe you should just attack with everything and hope to draw your lava axe. And then I would say, Luis, I'm not playing lava axe. And you probably fly away with your little devil horns or whatever. But <laughs> the point is that, you know, th this is the type of thing that you have to fight against, right? This is the type of thing that I go... I feel conservative here because I'm behind, but I have to know that that's not necessarily the right, the right thing to do. So these are all pitfalls that our brains do, and we address a lot of these on the show for those reasons. And that's why a lot of our attention you know, on the show is paid to trying to see these things ahead of time and trying to give you ways to avoid them. You know, confirmation bias and a whole host of other issues will pop up and they're always going to be there. It's really hard to just get rid of them um, you know, once and for all, but it doesn't mean that we can't be more aware of them and fight them. And hopefully, you know, part of the function of the show is to give you the tools and the awareness to do that. Ooh, that was a fun story time. So that was part one. Uh, and that's like <laughs> the theory, right? Like that's kind of the, the broad strokes theory behind uh, what we do on LR. For part two, though, this is about moving towards putting things into practice. Right. Yeah, this is and this is the part I, I tend to focus on more. <laughs> yeah, and I think that this is a part that we try to bring to the table, uh, even in the context of the first part. Right. Yeah. Like we we like to bring up these ideals and these ideas, but we really like to try to focus on getting you to, to that point. So let's talk about you know kind of tightening up your game and and getting to the to some of the things that you can actually do as a player to start seeing better results uh, until you get your feet under you. So as an example, if you go to a local game store, which I do sometimes uh, around here in Seattle, uh, and you look at a deck from a relatively inexperienced player or a drafter, you'll see a lot of mistakes. Like if you just like do a draft and then you walk up to somebody who's, you know, doing their fifth draft ever and you say, can I see your deck? You'll see a lot of mistakes. Uh, you have to learn the fundamentals of limited before you can properly go forward and start doing some of the fancier moves. So, for example, you'll see people play not enough lands or too many lands. You'll see people be too uh, 
too willing to splash and mess up their mana base. You'll see bad mana curves. You'll see decks that have conflicting game plans, meaning a bunch of aggressive cards and then a bunch of like control cards. And you're like, well, what, what are you what are you actually trying to do here? You'll see decks that have mana curves that are pushed up towards the top end because people think, well, these are my most powerful cards, so I want to play those. And they just don't really care about playing anything in the early turns of the game. And we all know how that ends up. Um, you'll see people react to uh, things like that we were just talking about. For example, they flood out twice with their deck. And they go, they I must land. have too many lands. Yeah, <laughs> so they take out a land or two and just say, well, I was flooding out, so I obviously don't need this many lands, right? These are the type of things that you'll see if you look at those decks. And so on LR, we have some tools and exercises that can help you hone those fundamentals and kind of get you back to basics so that you can then grow outward from that position once again. And one of our most impactful uh, sets of shows was the cabs and Uber shows that we did. Um, and while... Really, neither of these are the optimal way to draft overall. Like, th I don't think either of these represents like the perfect draft strategy. Cabs drafting, which is drafting cards that affect the board state, like creatures removal and combat tricks, can teach you a lot about the baseline creature curve decks that make up the bulk of limited play. Um, you can tell yourself, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to draft a cabs deck. I'm only going to draft cards that do one of those three things and I'm just going to issue the other stuff. Now, again, if you're if you got a lot on the line, this is not the optimal way to play. Usually there's a mix in of a few other types of cards in there when they're worthy. But this is a great way to say, okay, I get it now. Because one of the big problems that I see when I look at people's decks that are inexperienced at magic is that they have too much air. They have too many cards in their deck that just don't do enough, right? And when it comes to games of limited magic, it's usually all about creatures and about what those creatures are doing. And if you don't play stuff that affects the board and that can block, attack, kill a creature, do something, and you draw a hand that has three or four of those spells in it that are like card draw spells or some cute enchantment or you know some some equipment that's, that's expensive or whatever, you're just going to get ran over by a person playing a two drop, a three drop, and a four drop. Right. And right. and that just, you know, that, that can't be a place where you're happy starting out your, your limited deck with. Um, and then the other side of the scale is Uber, which I can't even remember what it stands for anymore. <laughs> Ultimate big end game ramp theory. <laughs> 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 That's right. I forgot. Uh, you know, this is where if you want to try to draft an Uber deck, you want to push the boundary in the opposite direction by drafting a deck that's focused on inevitability and using defensive speed, meaning cheap interactive cards to make sure that you don't die early and an overall long term game plan that can't lose. And this is a completely different take than the Cavs deck, but it's another interesting tool that can get you all the way to the end. Now, most of your really successful and good limited decks are going to fall between these two parallels, right? They're going to be, uh, you know, slanted hard in one direction, but maybe you run one or two cards in your Cavs deck that can help you really power through to the late game or give you a tool that you just wouldn't have access to otherwise. And, you know, maybe your Uber deck ends up being a little bit more towards the mid range where you're still playing some creatures and some certain draws, you can start beating people down, but you're, you're still trying to build towards that inevitability. The point is when you sit down and you try these out, even if you're giving up a little bit of equity in the short term by not drafting like perfectly optimal, I guarantee you'll learn a lot. I guarantee it that you'll just be like, wow, I, I understand how this type of archetype is supposed to function now. And now I can spread my wings out a little further when it's necessary, but understand that, you know, keeping it close to the vest on your primary strategy actually has a lot of benefit. And boy, if you're really new to drafting, try these cab stacks because I'll tell you what, you know, these are filled with not air. That's the whole point. And, yeah. you know, you're going to just draw cards. And when you draw a spell, it's going to matter which, versus a card that doesn't. And your opponent's going to be like, attack you with my two, three, threes. And you're like, yeah, okay, I guess I'm dead. And when you play cabs, that, that's just uh, almost impossible to happen. You're going to be playing games of magic that matter basically every time. And that's a, that's a huge difference. Um, so I recommend taking the challenge, do a cabs challenge, do an Uber challenge and see if you can, if you can do that. Um, another one, you know, that we like to try to, to harp on here is in, in various more uh, narrow ways, but it all falls under the big picture of showing discipline right? When you draft, when you build your deck and when you play can really yield benefits. It doesn't feel as fun. And and look, I, <laughs> I should put a caveat here. If, if you're sitting, if you want to sit down and draft and your primary mode is to have fun and you're not really as much of a spike, 
that is totally fine. I do that sometimes myself too. So, you know, don't feel like you're doing it wrong if you do that. Just understand that you're giving up some win percentage by doing that. And as long as you feel like that's a fine trade off for you, go for it. This is advice for people that are like, I don't win at this and I'm sick of it and I want to win. I want to beat the people in my shop or I want to win a PPTQ or I want to do well at a GP or whatever. Um, you know, th that's what this is for. But sometimes you got to bite the bullet and you got to take the not exciting two mana creature instead of some, you know, cool five drop that could be really sweet. Sometimes, even though you could splash, you have, you know, a really good card worth splashing. Generally speaking, you don't because the mana just isn't there and making sure that you have enough cards in your deck that actually do something in the time when they needed to do it instead of drawing these other things uh, is worth it, right? Same thing with cool enchantments or, you know, being picky about which auras you play instead of just jamming all of them, you know, um, Instead of drawing, putting too many divination type effects in your deck, earmuffs, Luis, you know, rather than playing stuff that actually affects the board. All of these things are, you know, tempting and they can kind of get away from you if you don't really do it. Same thing with your sitting at the draft, cooperating with your neighbor and trying to read the signals uh, rather than doing some greedy kind of, I'm going to cut a card from you just because I don't want you to have it, even though it's to your own detriment. Like if that actually hurts you. Uh, more than it than it, than it would potentially hurt your neighbor. Those type of things where you say, you know, I'm just going to take the card that I need. I'm going to take the mana fixing. I'm going to do the thing that I need to make sure that my deck functions the way I want to do it. These are all things that you can do, uh, you know, to help you to get a little yeah. more practical no, no, about it. Nobody wants to take the the two two for two over the sweet five drop, but if you always take the five drop, then you're going to lose a lot more. <laughs> That's right. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, now part three uh, comes in, and this is actually lined up a lot, Luis, with um, uh, you, with what you've, you know, a, a lot of your legacy for the show, um, you know, which is, I think, in many ways, having a plan and the ways that you can implement those plans. This is kind of putting it all together, right? Because you've got your theory, you've got some practical things that you can do to help gain a lot of win percentage, but you do need to be able to put all of these concepts together at once to actually realize the results in full when you start to get to become like a good magic player. Yeah. And, and having a plan was like the first level up I did because mm -hmm. it yep. all, it all stems from there. Like you just can't be, you can't just be playing magic with it. if you're if you don't have a plan while you're playing then you're just not at the next the the the, the next level of development like you're you're going to end up in a spot where you you're, you're taking game actions but they're not working towards any greater benefit and you're not going to end up winning nearly as much because a lot mm -hmm. of games of magic are won and lost on plays that seem inconsequential but they do matter a lot mm -hmm. uh, and so so kind of like the way we describe uh, how we want to structure the show and what level ups mean is in the short term, it's a lot more useful to, to listeners for us to say like healer's hawk is the best white common, or you should take, here's the curve that your Boros deck wants, or here's the, the best way to draft Demir because that'll help you win more in your next Gilza Ravnica draft. If you want to become a better magic player overall, theory is the way to do that understanding these theories and understanding kind of like the fundamentals and the reasons behind all these things. It's kind of like the, you know, teaching someone to fish versus handing them a fish. And we, I, I feel like we need to do a good mix of both because when it comes to having a plan that applies to, to everything. And if we don't give people not only enough theory and resources to get to the next level of development, then we're not going to, succeed long-term with what we want. But if we don't pair that with some like direct, actionable, applicable advice, then we're not going to help people in the short term. And that's going to either lead them to to bounce, to do something else, or to be more frustrated. Or also like part of what we, we want to offer you is, hey, this, this draft format's fun. How can I get better at it? Okay, listen to Ella. And so like that that is something that we want to be able to offer to, to people. So. That's right. And, and you'll see that in our show lineup, right? Like we, we kick off each set thing with the set review, right? And that's, and that's a, the most direct advice that we can give you to try to get you ready to get you comfortable with the set before you actually get the set in your hands. And then, you know, we'll do first impressions in a few shows about the new set. And that's, again, to, to get you steered in the right direction on what we've been thinking about it. Down the line, 
we'll do things like the archetype show where once we feel really comfortable with each of the archetypes, we'll go in depth on them so that, you know, anytime that you want to reference that or get an idea for maybe an archetype that you haven't tried to draft yet, you'll at least have an idea for what it's trying to do and what cards to look out for and that kind of thing. But also we'll pepper in these level up shows and these, uh, uh, you know, theory type shows. And we really are trying to push for both of those things. We also will try to have guests on that'll offer alternate opinions, right? Because Luis and I are kind of a united front, you know, when it comes to this mentality, we believe that this is the best way for you to improve and to become a better magic player is to combine practical uh, short-term advice about the set with uh, you know, practical long-term theory advice about how to improve as a player, but not everybody approaches it exactly how we do. So you can, you know, pick things from other people that work for you as well. Um, I mean, we're here to, to obviously push what we think is correct. So that's why we do it, but you're going to get other, other options there as well from other people. Um, but, and then, you know, the overall idea is that we weave in the theory into the practical short-term advice as well, right? We, we, we want to be hitting on these notes when we can about don't be rot, you know, just to remind you and to keep your mindset in the, in that type of, uh, you know, mindset. Yeah. And it, and it, it's a tough balancing act because again, we want to be able to provide both those things. We want to package it in a way that is pleasant to listen to. Uh, so, and we want you to know. have fun with it, you know, like that, yeah. that, that's all, that's all part and parcel of it. And to that end, I think that a lot of, what we strive for is helping people internalize these things, which is why sometimes you'll hear us say the same thing multiple times. You know, you'll hear us, you know, repeat ourselves. That's because we think that the lesson we're trying to say is important and that you're, you're not necessarily going to, you're going to get it with just one listen. No. And, and, and the things that I've done that have been worthwhile uh, as far as learning go required that as well. And I, I think that that's actually just a really important part of learning is, is understanding the the baseline fundamentals that drive the things that we're learning and, and repeating those is, is an important part of it as well. Uh, when it comes to to the having the plan part of things as well, can, can you describe um, what the difference is between having a plan like when you're sitting down to do the booster draft versus when you're sitting down to actually play your matches? Like in a more practical way, I mean, w you wouldn't, of course uh, – subscribe to having a plan before you sat down, right? You, you know, like, well, my plan is to draft, you know, Boros or whatever. Instead, it, it happens, it starts to develop as it goes. But, you know, what, can you contrast that with, with how it goes when you actually sit down to play the matches? Yeah, so in Booster Draft, the what you should be doing is knowing all the cards, knowing uh, how like how the different strategies, how those interact, what the implications of each each pick are. So it's not just like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're not going to walk in like, I'm going to draft Boros because that's that's just too simplistic. Like you, you shouldn't be that definitive about what you're going to do. But what you should do is, let's say uh, you're looking at taking a, a card in pick one uh, and let's say there's an a, aggressive red card, for example. You should know mm -hmm. what the context of taking that card is because – Taking a card like that doesn't mean it, it mean it, it implies like you know depending like Wojak bodyguard for example it's one mm -hmm. of the best red comments mm -hmm. it doesn't this is card is not equal in is it or Boros so you should actually know that when you're taking it you're actually leaning more towards Boros it's it mm -hmm. is better in Boros than it is in is it so you need to know like the additional context of these things and it, it, it's really valuable to know kind of what the different paths are in draft because. You can't just sit down and say, like, I'm going to first pick Deadweight and then I'm going to second pick Luminous Bonds because where are you going with that? Like, what is, what is your plan when you take those two cards? Like, right. granted, sometimes you just take the best card of the pack, the first couple packs, and you end up not playing one of those cards or you end up splashing um, something uh, like you splash uh, Luminous Bonds in your Golgari deck. Th that's all well and good. But you should know why you're taking those cards. Again, it, you having a plan it means more than just I'm going to draft Boros. It means like, what is, how is each card I take fitting into the overall deck that I'm trying to draft? And it's the same reason that you should, you know, when you, when you are drafting a Demir deck, knowing what your deck's missing and like, I'm going to take Dazzling Lights over Watcher in the Mist here. Not a pick you'd normally make, but sometimes the context does require that you make that pick and you should mm -hmm. know what you're doing when you make that pick. So it, okay. It's pretty important to to think of it that way, and then in game, you, your goal should should always be 
how am I going to win this game? How was my action or my actions working towards winning the game? The, the the most clear and concise examples are: you have a three two and your opponent has a two two. You choose not to attack be, when they, they've already attacked. Right, their creatures tapped because you want to block. You don't want to raise two damage. Your three damage versus their two damage, even though that's favorable because you've got an awesome seven drop in hand. When you cast it, you're probably going to win, and you're not. There's no real point for you to. To, to, to race because the game's not going to be on that metric. You're, you're playing for a long game. Your plan is to get, get to seven mana, cast a seven mana spell. And you see a lot of people who, if they're not playing with a plan, individual actions look appealing. Yes, it looks appealing to trade three for two until you realize what, what it is you're actually trying to accomplish here. Yeah. And, you know, an, another example where that shows up a lot, it's along the lines of what you're saying is um, if you have, let's say that your opponent plays the uh, halberdier, right? 3-2 for 3 mana, Junker, right? It's one of the worst cards in their deck. And you're playing, eh, let's say you're playing a Demir deck and your first play is a House Guild Mage, right? But you're not hitting your third land drop, at least currently. So you play it, you say go. And in your hand, you've got Notion Rain, you've got Watcher in the Mist, you've got a removal spell, you have a disinformation campaign, you got a way to trigger. I mean, your hand is just stacked, right? Because it's all spells. You're out of lands. You know, this is a common, this is a situation that comes up all the time where your opponent's like, well, I'll attack with my 3 2. And it's probably correct to block there, right? Because there's going to be a while. You're going to need to buy as much time as you can. And if you can simply just trade off resources now, uh, you're, you have all the power you need to win the game going forward as long as you find the time to cast those spells. You have card draw, you have, you know, ways to interact with your opponent, and you have ways to finish the game. Even though normally you'd never want to make that trade, right? That, that would be a, awful trade to make you're just like it's one of your worst cards and this is one of my better cards uh but you know again if if you're in tune to what your plan is given the situation that you're in then you would probably make the trade yeah and and knowing when that's appropriate is is really important because you can't you can't just uh you can't just play every game like everything's in a vacuum because you know uh, if you if you do that you end up using a good removal spell on their like three four flyer when you just know that they've got like a Trotta in their deck and mm -hmm. you just have to save a removal spell for that. Or, you know, your, your Boros Porn has Aurelia. So you're like, well, I've got this Crushing Canopy. Should I pick off their Sky Knight Legionnaire? And sometimes it's like, no, you have to save it for Aurelia. You can beat Sky Knight Legionnaire by by playing your Muse Drake. But mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's really tough to know exactly. But, but all of this is informed by your overall game plan, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the key. Is it like you have to keep – I mean, do you ask yourself – I mean, you probably don't anymore, but is it? would you recommend people, you know, like thinking in their head, okay, what's my plan? Yeah. Oh, it's very valuable. Like, you know, eventually you get to the point where you, you've you internalized it enough that you don't really think about it. You don't need to like actually double check. But there's going to be times when you need to decide for yourself like – and make sure, hey, is this achieving my goals? Is this getting me to where I need to go? And mm -hmm. it, it's worth double checking because sometimes you're you're not going to be there, and you're going to be like, oh, oops, I, I actually needed to to focus more on on this. Like, why am I do? Why am I taking this game action? You should you you don't always need to answer the question, but you should always be able to answer the question of why you're taking a game action. Yeah, you should put, point that mirror on yourself. By the way, buddy. What? I, I always ask you why you did stuff, and then you have to go, hmm. Because you just do it, and it's just like this intuitive, well, <laughs> like flow state thing, or whatever. And well, see, I have to, like, and like, I'm not saying you didn't have a reason, but I'm just like, man, like, I, I wish you weren't such a genius, <laughs> like, because then I could okay. like actually get some data out of you. <laughs> yeah, it, and and so the thing is, like, if you press me, I will be able to answer that question. It just might take me a true. bit to get there. But, yeah, you just have to go back and reverse engineer your brain. Like, it's, the, I mean, <laughs> the, well, there, there's times where it's just like, oh yeah, they they've got definite clarity in their hand. And mm -hmm. it's just like, how did you know that? It's like, well, I, I don't know. I just knew that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think at its core, just like, uh, you know, not being results oriented and, and knowing what EV means is one of the, the most valuable life lessons. Uh, when it comes to, to, to playing Magic and getting better in that, in that regard, I think having a plan is one of the most valuable lessons. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, one last little point here on that is, you know, it's often said that you should try to play with players who are better than you in order to improve. And the way that that actually plays itself out are things like the examples that we just gave. 
right? When you watch a really good player play and they just snap off a block with their house guild mage on the uh, halberdier, and you're like, whoa, like that, you know, like I listen to the set review. I, I know my stuff on, on limited. That guild mage is way better than the halberdier. Like, why would you make that block? Like, that just doesn't add up to me, right? And that you can have a, a, an experienced player say, well, look at my hand. And look at what I'm trying to accomplish this game. Anything that buys me time will give me a much better percentage chance of winning this game against this type of deck. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get me to that point. And you're like, oh, oh, okay, I see. You know, or the times when they don't make that block and then they just start activating the guild mage and they explain their, oh, I can just keep this thing tapped down and it gives me something to do with my mana anyway. And then if I hit it, you know, it's like, okay. And, you know, really good players find really creative and good plays, but they're not always obvious because you're just... You're always on one level and other people are on different levels. And sometimes they're on levels that are higher than you. And uh, it really helps to to see plays that make your eyebrows raise where you're like, wow, I did not expect that to happen. And then you start to piece together why these players are making the plays and you can start uh, adding that to your game plan as well. Okay. Um, why don't we talk about uh, just do like a little mini level up on guilds and then we'll call it a show here. Cause that was kind of the, the, hopefully that, that puts a, you know, overall umbrella on all of the stuff that we try to do on the podcast and where it came from and why um for level ups uh but but in the meantime we did want to give you something to take home with you for uh you know to to actually do when it came to guild guilds of ravnica so um one of the things that has been talked about a bit on twitter Luis, lately is well look the drafting part of guilds of ravnica's Kind of straightforward, right? I mean, it's it's a little on rails. There's only like five, you know, true decks that are supported. And kind of once you're in your deck, you kind of know what you're doing with it. Um, and that actually has put a lot more focus on the, the gameplay uh, rather than the draft. Yeah, I think that guilds is, like you said, is is a bit on rails because, yeah, there's one, there's five guilds. And like, like I used the example before, you're not going to draft black-white. It just doesn't make that much sense. You know, you're not going to draft blue green. It's really hard to end up in there because the the gold cards are so powerful. So, what exactly are you trying to 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 accomplish by going outside the guilds? Not much. So, you, we're going to assume you're sticking within those five guilds. And furthermore, once you're in a guild solidly, like sometimes you'll bounce around a little, and there's definitely enough plenty to talk about there. You know, and we're going to get through that as the format goes on. Like, what are good signs? When when should you be mm-hmm. leaving a guild? How can you be more flexible? Like. Yeah, sometimes you have to switch from Boros to Demir and nothing carries over. But sometimes you're like, uh, Demir doesn't seem open, but you know, Golgari is. I got two really good late green cards. I can pivot into Golgari. But past that, there's going to be plenty of drafts where you know what guild you are, right? It's pick five. You've taken four Boros cards. You're pretty sure you're going to be Boros. It would take something really, uh, really spectacular to move you off of Boros. From then on, the draft is really not that hard. Right. You, you're you're going to take the Boros gold cards. You're going to take the aggressive red or white cards. Or you're drafting Jameer. You're going to take, you know, the cards of the mana costs that help your deck. <laughs> like, you, you, yep. you're, you're going to take the blue and black cards that are good, and you're going to fill out your curve appropriately. So I think it's pretty important to kind of, if you, like, one of the, the things that we all speak to is efficiency. Because we know a lot, a lot of our listeners – they don't have the time to draft 20 times a week, 10 times a week, you know, maybe even five mm-hmm. times a week because most people don't. Like pros, protect, uh, you know, preparing for a pro tour might draft 20 times in a week, three three drafts a day. But the average person just does not have that kind of time or money or both. Mm-hmm. So if, I, if, I, if you want to be more efficient with your preparation, if you've got five hours of magic prep that you can put towards, uh, you know, a week, I think it's better to focus on the games because the games are where you're going to get your biggest edge in this format. I just don't think the drafting part of the format is very hard. It's just not that hard to identify which guild is open. And once a, you know a guild is open and you're in that guild, it's really not that hard to to, to maneuver from there. So mm-hmm. what I think is useful if you want to spend time is try to figure out what are the key decision points in games? What are the kind of play patterns for each guild? And for some of them, it's easy, right? Boros has basically one play pattern. It's attack you. It's yep. try to mentor my creatures. It's going to play one draws. It's going to try to, if it's lucky, play Skynet Legionnaire on three. And that's Boros' game plan. Demir, yeah, maybe Demir has some aggro decks, but mostly Demir's a control deck. Just going to try to grind you out yep. with a uh, disinformation campaign or just notion reigns and surveils and just cast a bunch of removal spells. 
is it's pretty tough. Is it can be either, and you actually sometimes won't know. They'll have an Electromancer and a Piston Fist Cyclops in play, and it looks like they're just holding the fort. They're just drawing cards. They're casting Chemistry's Insight, Radical Idea. And you're like, oh, it's Control, is it? Then they go, end of turn, double Sonic Assault, uh, <laughs> untap, you know, cast a Gravitic Punch, attack you for six Gravitic Punch. You're like, oh, okay, I guess they were the aggro, is it, deck? <laughs> yeah. But so is it could wear two different hats, and that's that's really important to know because some again some is it decks it's like yeah I'm gonna chump block your piston fist cyclops with my token on turn four because getting those four life plus the one life link because most of the tokens have life link is really important versus I'm gonna go for card advantage and try to grind you out against some is it decks you want to side in never happened three mana make them discard a card against some is it decks you want to side in barrier bones you know that's right like, it really depends the barrier actually is probably still too bad so knowing the the primary play pattern and secondary play pattern of every guild is really important i would spend time on that knowing how these how how these guilds finish their games off is important and what what common plays are from them uh you know i saw i saw my actually my college roommates came to play the grand prix and on at the end of day one, they were 6-1 facing against uh, BBD Ooh. and Seth Manfield. Mm-hmm. And they had the game locked up against Boros with their Celestia deck, but a Cosmotronic Wave ended the game Ooh. in Boros' favor. Like, yep. they, they, they attacked with two creatures. The Boros player, uh, it was uh, Corey Baumeister, just just took it down to like two. No blocks, didn't even try to block. Untap, Cosmotronic Wave, attack you with everything for exact lethal. And Ooh. in this particular case, they couldn't have done anything different, so that's, just, that's whatever. But... It's that sort of thing, knowing, oh, they could kill me that way. Instead of adding to the board here, I'm going to actually just leave up all my mana because I've got this trick that can protect me here. Mm -hmm. Or against Demir, knowing, yeah, a lot of their game plan involves like looping devious cover-ups or disinformation campaign plus unexplained disappearance to bounce, get back the disinformation campaign, make you discard your last card, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I would spend a lot of time focusing on the actual gameplay because I think that you know, in some form, it's like in Dominaria, I think that the draft was a bigger portion of the overall difficulty of the whole exercise than the gameplay was. Definitely. The, yeah, the those was lines got blurred more. Yeah. But the draft was a lot harder. So here, I think if you're going to study, there's plenty to study and the games are plenty hard. I'm not trying to minimize that because I think in guilds, the games are pretty di- they're pretty difficult. There's a lot of back and forth and there's a lot of cool stuff going on. I just think that the the, the drafting part is a little simpler than what we've seen. So you... So, like, you'll see our shows. We're still going to talk about how to draft the different archetypes, but I think that we, especially, you know, trying to look at what the listeners would want, should focus a little less on that and a little more on how you can build your deck and how you and how you can play the games out. Because I think that's actually what is a little bit harder, you know, currently. So, yeah, I can tell you right now that Inescapable Blaze and its existence has made me play games out in such different ways than I norm- than I would if this uh, card wasn't in the format. Uh, you know, as, as a good example to go along with the Cosmotronic Wave thing. That is an absolute game plan that these decks have. And if you're playing a slower, a controlling deck, it is a card that you genuinely have to be worried about because you can't counter it. And it's such a huge chunk of damage that they can just line up some ridiculous huge attack and get you down to six or capitalize on a quick start and just sit back while you're sitting there drawing cards. You know, you're at eight life. Do you really want to cast that notion rain? You got to think about it, right? Do you, do you have a way to get the card out of their hand? Do you have a thought erasure? Do you, can you, can you grind it out with a disinformation campaign? These are things that if you don't focus on study up and understand that you're just going to be like, Oh, drew notion rain. I'm at eight. Sure. I'll play it. And then there's like in response, you know, and you're just dead and you just, and it's just because, and you should have known, like you should have known, Hey, I could get away with not casting this spell or I should block here to not go from 10 to six. I should just throw away a creature that's not going to do anything anyway, because next turn I'm going to cast a creature that can block where normally you wouldn't just toss a creature. You'd use your life total as a resource, for example, and cards like Cosmotronic Wave, Inescapable Blaze. If you're aware of all those things, then it matters. Another play pattern that comes up a lot, you mentioned briefly before was Boros and how they curve out. And you said, well, they try to get a mentor trigger. Well, if you can prevent them from getting a mentor trigger, you're doing very good work. And that means sometimes not maximizing your chance for a blowout by waiting till their turn or not uh, necessarily killing like an awesome creature. But, you know, I'll tell you what, once they start getting those counters going, 
that's where things really spiral out of control for you. So you want to use your removal way more liberally than you normally would. Normally, I'm an advocate for only using your removal when you need to and trying to leverage your creatures, you know, to interact with their creatures. But in that deck, I am so much more likely to just main phase use even a good removal spell on a blade instructor or on a healer's hawk or something like that than I normally would be. And it's because I've seen how the play patterns play out and you get behind against a mentor counter and it snowballs and then you just can't come back anymore, even if you have good blockers. So you're kind of forced to use your removal. Of course, that goes back and touches on the uh, the dead weight that we were talking about earlier and how good it can be. Okay, good stuff, Luis. Um, a little takeaway there from guilds and then some bigger picture LR level up stuff that hopefully is helpful for you uh, in the long run. Um, by the way, Luis, I looked it up. Yeah. It is a quickling, the play mat. Oh, <laughs> okay. Which means that it came from GP Salt Lake City that I played. <laughs> the, the one uh, oh, with yes, the, yes, yes. You know, the tokens and stuff. It, it, it was the last time we had Convoke. So, yeah. So, anyway, that's where I got that one. And that one will be uh, t- sent off as well. Um, that's going to do it for LR this week. Um, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by channelfireball.com where you can go to sell your cards. You can actually trade them in for store credit and get a 30% bonus on anything in the store. Or you can just get cash for them. And this is something that I highly recommend doing as uh, – Magic can be expensive, and this is a way to get back some of that money. So make sure you check out their buy list over there at channelfireball.com, and uh, it's going to do it. We'll see you next week. So <laughs> you you kick things off by uh, telling me a nice genius for Grifter. So actually, uh, let, let's start with that. Why don't you go ahead and, and explain that, because this actually happened to you. Oh, God. I have to say this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was playing at the GP. And this is a team event. Uh, I did get to play at GP Denver. My team ended up going three and three and dropping. Um, but before that happened, we were playing and I, I uh, rolled the dice against my opponent, kept my hand, looked at it, kept my seven. And then my opponent was thinking, uh, I, I decided to be on the play. And my opponent was thinking, and while they were, my teammate Adam said, hey, what do you think of this board state? So I looked at that. And then my other teammate, Woody said, would you keep this hand or not? And I said, yeah, sure, keep it. And when I got my attention back to the middle table uh, where I was sitting, my opponent was like, okay, we can play now. I'm like, okay, so you kept. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I draw my card for the turn. And then I go, oh, no. I'm like, I'm on the play, aren't I? And I look at my opponent. I'm like, I said I was on the play. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And so I just drew a card on the first turn of the game like I was I don't know, playing commander or something. So I <laughs> raise my hand and I'm like, judge. And the judge comes over. And the hand that I had kept was a two-lander. It was a, a, a plains in a swamp, excuse me, a, an island in a swamp, and then a bunch of really good cards like Notion Rain uh, and you know some good creatures and, and a removal spell, just a bunch of good stuff. But I really did need to find that third land. Well, the card that I had accidentally drawn, or whatever, the card that I drew uh, that I didn't mean to was uh, actually a Demir Guildgate giving me my third land. So the judge explains to me, okay, uh, the judge asks, well, has the card touched your hand? I said, yes, it has. And the judge says, all right, you're going to get a game rule violation, which is like a kind of like a warning that you can't get too many of or else you'll start getting game losses. And he said, the way we fix this is you reveal your entire hand to your opponent, all of the cards, all eight of them at this point, and your opponent can take any of them, any one of them, and shuffle it back into your library. And then, of course, they also get to play the rest of the game knowing literally every card in your opening hand. The thing that got kind of weird is that my opponent decided to take what is probably my most powerful spell in my hand, which was a Watcher in the Mist, but left me with the dual land that I really needed or at least really wanted to make this whole hand go. And so I felt kind of weird because they took away this powerful card. Now, of course, I didn't get to see their hand. And there's every chance that, you know, they were fine with me casting these early spells but had no answer for the flyer or something along those lines. And so I can't really comment on it. But it did feel a little bit weird because somehow I actually felt like my hand got better after breaking the rules like this. Now, I did, (laughs) again, receive a game rule violation. So it wasn't like... You know, these things aren't free or whatever, but it did feel like a little genius or griftery by the end of it. I don't know. I felt bad. Yeah, I, I think that uh, 
I don't think it actually qualifies as either genius or grifter because most of the time your opponent's just going to take the card that's worst for you. Like mm -hmm. the, 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 your hand is going, your hand is going to get overall worse when you say I'm going to draw a card and then my opponent's going to duress me. So mm -hmm. clearly that's that's not good. It's yeah, just also, they get it, the information of every card in my hand. Yeah, yeah. They 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 they, they get all that. So yeah. I think it's funny. I do think that like it ended up working out better for you here, but most of the time that's just not going to be the case. So okay. So uh, I'm not I, a genius and I'm not a grifter. I would not call it either of those things. <laughs> I am mid-range, yeah. Yeah. My my story is pretty awkward. Uh, this is a long time ago. So th this is from – this this happened to me. This is in 2007. This okay. is a Pro Tour uh, – or sorry, Grand Prix Philadelphia. And I'm playing uh, a deck with Counterbalance. And what Counterbalance does, it's an enchantment for two mana. When you're, whenever your opponent casts a spell, you may reveal the top card of your library. If the casting cost is the same – then counter that spell. So, and I'd sense he's divining top, right? Now, this is like one of the most unbelievably annoying decks to play against, but it, it was really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, my opponent cast a cryptic command, and, and that's a uh, four mana, and you choose two of four modes, including like counter, bounce, draw a card, tap all creatures. So, my I, I knew that the order of my top three cards. My opponent cast cryptic command. I immediately flipped my top card to counter with counterbalance because I knew my top card costs four. Mm hmm. Uh, my opponent at this point was like, wait a second. And, and I'd already revealed because I, I had I had gone too fast because, uh, uh, you know, I, I just knew I was going to counter it, even though, again, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. My opponent was like, hold on a second. I didn't I didn't name the modes for cryptic. And I'm like, that's fine. You can name the modes, you know, because that's something you're supposed to do when you put it right, on the they, stack. Okay. They, they just said cryptic command and I just went counterbalance, but they, they should have actually named the modes. Mm hmm. I told them it was fine. They could just name the modes they wanted. And they're like, no, I want to call it judge. And I'm like, okay, but I, I don't know. I don't know why. Like, Right. Like whatever the modes are, they're getting countered anyway. So who cares? Well, it wasn't getting countered actually. <laughs> it, oh. I, I got the order wrong. My top card wasn't a four. Oh, I see. But uh, I didn't particularly care whether they – whether they uh, uh, named the modes. They could just name the modes. Like I, I – I knew that it was resolving and they could, I, I was just yeah. like, I was like, that's fine. Name whatever modes you want. They're like, no, I think I should call a judge. I'm like, if you want to call a judge, you can, you know, <laughs> that that's fine. So sure. they, they call, they call a judge. Uh, the judge comes over and asks the question and they're like, yeah, so they, you cast cryptic and you revealed with counterbalance. I'm like, yeah, but they hadn't named the modes yet, but that's fine. They could just name the modes. Like, you know, and the judge is like, okay, we're going to back it up. Cryptic command is going oh, no. on the stack. Oh no. And I'm like, okay. They're like, now name the modes. And my opponent named the modes. And I'm like, am I allowed to use Sensei's Divining Top before my right. counterbalance resolves? Like if you, if you backed up, this is now going on the stack. And the and the the judge was like, yeah, you can, you can do that. It's like, okay. Uh, so I rearranged it so I could counter the cryptic command. Because <laughs> wow. I, I was yeah, allowed that, to do that. That's actually very similar, isn't it? Like that ended up benefiting it's, you, but like... It felt like I was getting away with something because I was. But on the other hand, like... My opponent was the one who was adamant that we should have a judge resolve this. And so when the judge resolved it, they backed it up to the point where I got to name the modes. Did you feel just, weird? Oh, yeah. I, I did not feel I, – I did not I did not love that outcome. Like I actually think like were it today, I probably would not let that happen. But – You would have hmm. – but what are you supposed to do? I mean if the judge – Just let it – just let just, – Accept that you screwed up the counterbalance because I, I did screw up the counterbalance. Like, of course, of course, that that, that was on me, you know. But it, the whole thing was just so weird. Like, it, and honestly, like, I think that uh, I think that there is a lot that I like. There is a lot I would do differently, you know, de depending on what the rules are. But I was very much within the rules here. Like, absolutely. It, and and even to the point where my opponent was the one who wanted to call a judge when I said you could just name the modes and, and we could progress. Like. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just, it was just, the whole thing was just very funny. So, so are you I, a genius or a grifter? I don't think either. I, I, I certainly am not a genius because I just counterbalanced incorrectly for no reason. <laughs> but uh, that, that is a hit on your genius credibility. Yeah. yeah but Much I'm like also, drawing a card on turn one when you're on the play. <laughs> yeah. But I also, I don't think I grifted my opponent. I think they kind of grifted themselves. I, so, I, I, I agree with you. I think any uh, long term tournament player would tell you. <laughs> You can do it. You should like it. Just it's, it's sometimes because it, the of course the the real discussion comes in when uh, you know would your opponent do that to you? 
they probably yeah. would. So. Well, that, that's the same reason that like I, I had a, a, a situation where my opponent cast a six mana spell for five mana, a, a creature and limited, and we didn't notice until later, until like mm-hmm. a turn later, and the judge said it's just they, they, there's nothing they can do. Yep. At that point, like it, it, my opponent is okay to attack with that creature. Like yes, yes, they got it into play incorrectly, but it wasn't on purpose. And sometimes you screw things up. And the fact that they're going to attack me with it there means that I should probably attack people with those creatures when that happens to me. At other, you know, when yeah, I do it incorrectly, it does. It's just, it's just there's not always clean answers to stuff like that. So yeah, all right, fine. You're 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 off the hook as well then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It, it it did feel weird. I'm not going to lie, but it it is the sort of thing that uh. I don't know. I, I was told I could do this thing. I, I had already accepted I screwed up and was ready to go. But uh, you know, if my opponent wants to, <laughs> if my opponent wants to, to, to back up, then they, they, I guess they're allowed to back it up. 